Good morning. First, I'm honored by Paula Horn Covington's invitation to speak about her brother. And I want to salute Paula for being the best sister anyone could ever have. She was with Mike every step of the way on his long journey. Robert Michael Horn, I first met him 36 years ago. It was 1981, and I was running Phoenix radio stations KOY and KQYT. The stations were then owned by Southern Broadcasting, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. At that time, I was a regional vice president in charge of overseeing the company's stations in Phoenix and Memphis and Houston. Well, on one of my trips to Houston in 1981, I remember the general manager of our Houston FM station, Kind, K-Y-N-D, her name was Vicki Williams, telling me about this new sales manager that she just hired from Memphis, tall, good-looking guy. His name was Mike Horn, and Mike, that night, wanted to have dinner with me and learn more about advancement opportunities in Southern Broadcasting. So I said, sure. So Mike and I went out to dinner that night in Houston. Well, even before the first drinks came, Mike said, Gary, how does a fella get to be a general manager at this company? <laughs> I said, well, Mike, uh, if you're a successful sales manager, you, you'd certainly be considered to be a, a, a general manager someday. He said, well, do you make the decisions on who the general managers are? Nah, yes. not really. That's my boss in Winston-Salem, a fellow by the name of Bob Jones. He's the president of the company. He, he really makes those decisions. Well, then, would it be okay if I called him and went on record with him that I want to be a general manager? He said, yeah, sure, you can call him Mike. So I gave Mike Bob's phone number right then, that night. So the next day, I fly back to Phoenix, and by the time I get to my office, there's a call slip from Bob Jones, wanting me to call him. So I got Mr. Jones on the phone, and he said, Gary, I just finished talking with that new sales manager we got down there in Houston, Mike Cohen. Wow, he sounds like he really is ready to be a general manager. <laughs> He's got all this enthusiasm and energy. Seems to me he could really help our sleepy FM station in Phoenix if we made him general manager. Why don't you just fly him out to Phoenix and see what you think? Of course, it's your decision. <laughs> so the next day, Mike flew out to Phoenix and we quickly cut a deal for him to become the new general manager of KQYTFM. Now, do you remember that station? Soft instrumentals, dinner music, doctor's office music, Montavani. Our television commercial said, every great city has one great radio station that plays beautiful music. Phoenix has KQYT, quiet, FM 95, with 54 minutes of music every hour. Quiet is beautiful. Well, Mike did not run quiet like a beautiful music station. He ran it like a rock station. He brought in his friend Bob Bollinger to be the sales manager, and they put together a stellar staff of salespeople, mostly women, who became the best <laughs> in Phoenix Radio. And by the way, I see that many are here today. <laughs> they didn't listen to the quiet music on the radio. They just sold lots of advertising for it. And they had so much fun in the process. Every Friday afternoon, they'd celebrate the sales of the weeks in the conference room with beer. In fact, at 4.30 every Friday afternoon, it was known as Beer 30. And it was just fun working there. Mike was an inspirational leader for his team. He'd teach them things like, never take no from a person who can't say yes, and do things in the order of their importance. And he'd say, it's what you learn after you know it all that counts. A quote that our company really liked from the basketball coach, John Wooden, and Mike was a huge basketball fan. He created all kinds of promotions like the Phoenix Fall Food Festival at the convention center and incentive trips for clients who spent big money with us in the first quarter. He took them to places like Hawaii and Barbados, and he personally got to know every single client on these trips and everybody loved Mike. This Mississippi man was a real Southern gentleman. 
Now, like many Southerners, Mike said y'all a lot. And sometimes he said all y'all. Well, he explained the difference. He said y'all is when I'm just talking to three or four people. If I was talking to a big room full of people, I'd say all y'all. Mike was every bit as nice to the paper boy or the hamburger flipper or to people like his good friend Herb Drinkwater, the mayor of Scottsdale. He was just nice to everybody. One December, he was in his office at Central and Roosevelt, and he noticed the city of Phoenix didn't have any Christmas decorations up, for goodness sakes. He was used to Christmas decorations, so he wanted to know why there weren't any Christmas decorations up and down North Central Avenue. So what did he do? He convinced the city to put some up by making it easier for them to pay for them because Mike sold the sponsorships to the Christmas decorations. <laughs> so the next December, the Christmas lights were up and running on Central. Mike loved Christmas. When he ran 55 KOI, he created the KOI Christmas Festival of Music. On Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, 30 straight hours of uninterrupted Christmas music. It was his gift to his listeners from KOI. In the late 80s, we decided to change the format of KPYT FM from beautiful music to top 40. So one day, the station's music abruptly changed from Montavani to Madonna. It was KOI FM, branded as the new Y95, featuring the Y Morning Zoo with Tim Hattrick. And Glenn Beck, yes, that Glenn Beck. On the day of the format switch, I asked Mike if he'd gotten any calls from KQYT listeners. He said, oh, yes. I just got off the phone with this lady from Sun City. She called and she said, I've been listening for years to quiet all day, every day. She said she had a radio still tuned to 95.5, but there was something wrong. Her radio was thumping. <laughs> Y95 was a big success for Mike. He went on later to manage the legendary Q105 in Tampa. But he wanted to come back to Phoenix. So he came back to Phoenix and there he led the great oldie station, Cool FM. After his radio days, there were many more successful ventures for Mike. Results Media with Bo Lane, Spin Six, and his latest winning company, Off Madison Ave, with Lorraine Marietta, who we are here. Dave Anderson and Roger Herman. Now, can't you just picture Mike at that big radio station in heaven looking down on us now and saying, for coming here today, I just want to thank all y'all. <laughs> Mike, we loved you and we miss you dearly.
I think about the mentor who influenced, challenged, inspired, and supported many of us as we focused on achieving our goals. He personally touched many of us by giving us the one shot we wanted. Whether it was for me to be his part-time CFO so that I had work-life balance, or whether it was your first job in a career choice for which you had no experience, he believed in you. I think about the counselor who used that deep Mississippi drawl, and unfortunately, I cannot do voices like Gary, <laughs> and his kind spirit to calm every soul who leaned on him and took the time to meet up with friends who needed his calmness and support during their time of strife. I think about the boss with a heart of gold whose employees drank his sweet tea metaphorically. He elevated and empowered all to succeed. As Maya Angelou said, and I will quote, I have learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And there are many of us here who will never forget how he made us feel. I think about the Southern gentleman who was once one of Phoenix's most eligible bachelors and used that infectious smile to charm his way to raising lots of funds for charities. He also served on local boards to give back to a community he loved. I think about the music lover and his music-loving friends, and you know who you are. I think about the music festival experience with, experiences with those beloved friends and his guitars. He loved music. Paula shared with me he played in a band when he was younger with James, John, and Farrell. And it was called, get this, the psychedelic sound of the other side. <laughs> he tried putting a band together at Spin Six and off Madison Ave with no success. But I bet you he's put that band together in heaven. And maybe he's even using that old band's name. I think about the friend who was so full of joy that he loved making all of us laugh with his silliness. He was also quick to forgive when you heard him. Okay, maybe some of the forgiveness was not very quick, but he eventually forgave. I think about my friend, an older brother, a title he earned because he called me his big bossy big sister, and I kept asking Paula, why does he say that? I'll never forget when I learned that he came from humble beginnings in Mississippi. Being the cocky person I was, I mistakenly thought he had been born with a silver spoon. Oh, he set me straight real fast. I admired him even more for persevering in life and working on defining his success as we all know it. Mike knew I was always just one call, text, or email away. He knew I would help him. He will always have a positive impact on my life. All I know today, like a lot of you here, is, he, is that we are better people for having known him. He truly will be missed, and his memory is a blessing. Lastly, I think about the legend, who I thought may have left unfinished business, but on the contrary, due to the many wonderful memories in our hearts and minds, his legacy will live on through each of these memories until we meet again. Rest in peace, our dear friend.
I can call me Mr. North. I don't know why he would call me Mr. North, but he called me Mr. North. He was one of the first calls I got when I got here in 1992 in Phoenix as a general manager of Channel 5. He called and said, let's have lunch. So we had lunch. Immediately, I liked this guy. And at the end of lunch, Gary, you'll appreciate this, he lets me know that he's starting a new media buying company and he wants our business. <laughs> I said, okay. In fact, Channel 5 was the first client for Results Media. That seems like late years ago. Then as I got to know Mike on a personal level, I got introduced to his daughter, Alex. Alex at the time was three years old. And I marveled at the relationship that those two had and that I saw transition over the years. And Mike is clearly in the Father Hall of Fame. So we're trying to talk to Alex and she couldn't quite catch at three years old, Mr. North. I was trying to teach her my name. So we tried a lot of different combinations and finally we found one that stuck. And I was referred to as Uncle Fat Pat. <laughs> Twenty-some years later, that's pretty accurate. <laughs> she drew me this picture when she was five years old. It looks like me in the morning. I framed it and I've had it on my desk ever since. So, and I will cherish this because it makes me have fond memories of the relationship that Mike and Alex had together. I'll share with you a couple of stories. During one of Mike's journeys, he moved in with me and he referred to me as Rumi. And, uh, had a place over at the Biltmore. And one summer weekend, uh, I discovered when I came home Sunday night that he and Alex had spent all weekend planting flowers in my backyard. Before that, there, there were no flowers in my backyard. I came back, it was beautiful. They'd spent hours and hours and hours doing this. So a couple of days later, I'm thinking, you know, I better get out there and water these flowers. So I get up, I go out in the back, got my little water pail, whatever it is, gonna water the flowers. I turn the corner and there's Mike. We're both standing there in our underwear. He's watering flowers. <laughs> he looks at me in this little bit of a pregnant pause and he said, Rumi, I think it's time for me to move out. <laughs> Just last September, when he uh, came out with our family and to my loving wife, Tammy's son, Brett and Gretchen, who are here today, had a wedding in Vail. And we had a golf outing, and Mike said, I haven't played golf in forever, right? And we, we knew that he was hurt. He would never let you know that he was hurt. But he decided to play golf. So there was three of us, a guy named Mike Apple, who's another media guy um, out of Kansas City, a good friend of Michael's also. So I said, Mike Horn will pick you up, take you to the course. He said, no, 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 I'll meet you there. So I get to the golf course, now, take, keep in mind, Mike hadn't played in years. And he's there, he's already worked up a sweat. I said, what are you doing? He said, how long have you been here? He said, well, I've been here for two hours, warming up. <laughs> he was banging balls on the range with rental clubs. We played that day, we got a little swing oil, and we went out, and he had his best round of golf in his entire life. It was truly a special day that I'll never forget. There's a wise guy named Aristotle that said, you know, there are three kinds of friendships. There's a friendship of utility, which means there's some purpose, some use in your life, in your friend's life. A friendship of pleasure, which is, you like hanging out with them. And a friendship of good, which is respect and admiration. I was one of the lucky ones that had all three of those in my friendship with my corner. You know, behind those steely blue eyes of his and his ever-present smile, there was a brain and a heart that focused on everybody around him, even while all his body was being ravaged by cancer the last six years. It was incredible to watch. He is genuinely the toughest guy I've ever known and ever will know. He's tapping me on the shoulder right now. He's saying, don't forget to thank some people. So I'm going to send out a shout of thanks from Mike to... Some special folks, one is Melissa Marler, who have been a friend of Mike's for 25 years. Thank you for being there in the good times and the bad times. He told me 
quite often how much he appreciated you. And his sister Paula, Paula, you're an angel. He would talk so much about you, so proud of you, and the fact that people should know that you were at his side in this last surgery 24-7 for 40 plus days. And to your husband Ken and your whole family. And the patience and the understanding that Ken and the family had while they had issues on Ken's side of the family, major health issues, allowing Paula to stay here and comfort Mike when he needed it most. You know, we all know Mike loved music, and every time we would hang out, the Eagles would come on, we had to turn the volume up. We couldn't talk, you had to listen to the whole song. <laughs> and as I started looking at titles of Eagles songs, it, it represents Mike's life. Let me read a few of these to you. How about the best of my love? Here's one. Busy being fabulous. <laughs> Do something. Heartache tonight. I can't tell you why. I wish you peace. Take it to the limit. Tequila sunrise. Reminds me of 4th of July. This, in 2016, Mike came down with Trish to uh, our place in Cocoa Beach, referred to as Cuckoo Beach, and we had an unbelievable holiday weekend. And Mike came in and as a gift, he stopped at uh, one of the libation stores and bought a bottle of Don Julio 1942. He went in and he asked him, he said, I need a bottle of Don Julio 1942. And the clerk goes, um, I think we might have one in the back room. He goes back, he dusts it off, he brings it out. Mike said, I need two. He said, we only have one. But we had a fabulous weekend on that 4th of July that I'll never forget. Mike always had a pulse for high performance while balancing the pain and the stress of his cancer. He had the real rare gift to transform threat into challenge with focus and realistic optimism. Some folks say you gotta go through hell to get to heaven. Mike certainly is a testament to that. He's now gone to a higher altitude where one breathes a lighter air, the air of spiritual freedom. Mike would want all of us to remember that every day is a gift. Rest in peace, my friend, until we meet again. Thanks. Hello. Uh, thanks to everyone that came today. I know everyone in here loved Mike, which shows the kind of guy he really was. Uh, I think most of you probably know, but my name is Brooke, and this is my sister Haley. Before speaking today, I knew I'd be this nervous, so I thought it'd be rest to read what I've written prior to the service. Anyways, Haley and I were Mike's stepchildren. We were lucky enough to have met Mike when we were four and five years old. In fact, I remember meeting Mike for the first time. I met him at his house when he then introduced me to his daughter, Alex. I remember she had the biggest smile I think I've ever seen. Mike always told people, that when Alex first met Haley and I, she thought she had two new toys to play with. <laughs> After a couple hours of conversation, uh, my mom, Mike, Alex, Haley, and I had become best friends. Before I knew it, three years went on and we were all officially a family. Looking back on it, that was probably One of the best things to happen in my life. I had a father figure who cared about me just as much as he would his own real son. Beyond that, he loved Haley, my mom, and Alex with 110% of his heart. Uh, we have so many fa memories as a family, like when we went around the world on vacations. I remember Mike and I were a team against my mom and sister in a game of cards in Italy. And after we dominated them in a game of gin, Mike referred to us as the Lords of Amalfi Coast for the rest of the entire trip. 
There are countless memories with Mike that we must embrace and hold close to our hearts for the rest of our lives. I got to have Mike as a role model who showed me how life should be lived. He showed me that family comes first. He showed me that you can never be too nice. And he showed me that each day is a gift. Looking back at my time with Mike, all I can say is I wish there was more of it. Whether we were playing horse in the driveway, arguing whether LeBron is better than Larry Bird, or laying on the beach in California, I loved every second of it. Mike will forever be a huge part of my life because he is someone who impacted me the most. He is someone I'll tell my kids about and someone my kids will tell their kids about. Mike did so much for me and Haley, and all I can say is that I hope I'm at least half as good of a man as he was. Something that struck me as so special about Mike was when 15 years ago, when he was starting dating my mom, he didn't turn around when he found out she had two children under six years old. Instead, he took us in like his own and showed more love to us than I can even put into words. It's my honor and privilege to speak on behalf of my mom, sister, and myself to tell you how much we loved Mike and how much he will be missed. That man was placed on earth by God to change people's lives. That man did he change mine. Responsibility and privilege of, of actually telling her um, about her dad. Um, Teresa King, I'm not sure where Teresa is today, but she was phenomenal. Teresa um, flew out to Phoenix and stayed there from Monday to Friday. So we waited until um, Teresa was in place and we had a team of staff who were in place and then they gave me the heads up to make the call to Alex. and. It started out as a little chit chat, like we usually talk, and we went on with that for a little while. And then I told her that um, I needed to talk to her about her dad. And she said, Dad is very sick. And I said, Yes, Alex, he, he has been very sick. And she said, How was he doing? You know, that sweet little Alex voice. And I took a good breath and said, Alex, your dad is very, very happy. God called his name and gave him a ticket to go to heaven, and he's so very happy there. And um, she had made a comment that um, heaven is a happy place, and that she would always have her dad in her heart, and she would miss him. Um, I'm not sure all the conversation that took place afterwards, but um, I've been told that um, she, uh, afterwards she was asked if there were any questions, and um, I don't think there were. And they moved on with their day. Um, Teresa took her to lunch. Uh, she picked her favorite place. She wanted to go have pizza. 
and then they took her out into one of the favorite parks there in Phoenix and released a handful of happy face balloons um, up into the clouds for her dad. Um, so just pray for Alex in the days to come. Um, she's done well this week, thanks to Teresa and many people surrounding her who love her so much. And, and pray for me and my family as we make the transition to be um, guardians for her. And um, that baby girl was loved so much um, by her dad. Um, Mike's wish is for Alex to stay uh, at BSTN as long as she's stable and happy. Um, but at some point, his ultimate dream was for her to come to Mississippi and be near her family. And um, we are praying uh, that God would uh, help her to be so successful where she is that she can make the transition um, to be with us. Um, I'd like to share a few memories of my brother. Um, I thank you to everyone who shared things. You, you told me many things I didn't know about him. So now I'm going to tell you a few things that you don't know about him. <laughs> um, because the memories of my brother span, like I said, over 60 years. Um, he was four when I was uh, born on my mom's 22nd birthday. And he told me recently that I really turned his life upside down. <laughs> uh, he had been the only child, the center of attention, and uh, now there's a new baby in the house. But he got over that soon and we became the best of friends. Um, we grew up in rural Mississippi. It was a kinder, gentler time. We played flag football with our cousins, basketball. We built forts in the woods. Mike would be yielding a machete, if you know, <laughs> can imagine that. And uh, he would cut down pine saplings, and we would tie them together and build a fort. Well, the problem with this project is we didn't understand, we underestimated the amount of saplings that it would take for that. And so when we made our first entrance into our newly built log cabin, we had to crawl in on our bellies <laughs> because, it, and then we couldn't even like sit up straight. We had to like sit slumped over. So our next project was a little more sophisticated. We decided to build a tree house in an old, old tree that actually is still standing. Um, my very strategically nailed boards up the side of the tree and my job was to pass boards up to him for him to be able to build the tree house. And um, it was a successful project, but when he decided that no girls were allowed, he took down the lower steps to the tree house, so I was no longer allowed to be there. Um, that's what brothers do. At a certain age, you know, little sis aren't so, you know, wanted in the, in the camp there. But um, we played, um, remember the little plastic toy soldiers, army soldiers? We, um, we played that very often. Sometimes it was cowboys and Indians with the same little plastic figures. Um, he loved an electric football game that he got one Christmas. He played with that for hours at the time. And recently when I was there, he voiced um, that he would like to have one of the um, old versions of the electric football game. So I had already been Googling Amazon to try to find one for him. But um, we used to ride our bikes to a little mom and pop store called Kalem Grocery. And uh, this is really gonna age me here. But with a 25 cents, we could buy a Coke, candy, and chips. Uh, this, it was a small glass bottle, was five cents, and the tall one was 10 cents. And we thought we were the richest people in the world to take our quarters and go to the store and have huge snacks. Um, he loved to put together model cars. And I think that's where his love of cars began. If you know Mike, you know he loved his cars. His first one was a 1957 olive green Rambler. Um, it was a real looker. <laughs> <laughs> and then the next car he had was a black Volkswagen, followed by an Aqua Mustang. And after getting his first real job in advertising, he came home with a black Corvette. And uh, I can remember him keeping every car he ever owned, like you could see your reflection in it at any time. And Dare Not Sister put a smudge or a fingerprint on the side. Um, in his teen years, he played in bands. Um, Lorraine, I showed a business card to her yesterday. 
and truly it was, uh, it actually read on the card, the psychedelic sounds of the other side. <laughs> and uh, I've been amused at the things that I had found going through pictures. In high school, he was concerned about my social life. He thought that um, I should get out more. I was content to stay home. And he tried to remedy that by inviting me to parties at his friend's house. So off we'd go together. However, being the protective brother that he was, he never allowed me to date any of those friends. <laughs> when I asked why, he just smiled and said, just because. <laughs> Through the years, we were separated by time and distance, but our love remained strong. The past few years, we've experienced the best of times and the worst of times. We've laughed, we've cried, and we've prayed together. He took me to all his favorite places and made sure to introduce me to the friends he knew would be important for me to know and trust. He was a kind, he was loving, he was full of life. The degree of pain and suffering he endured during this past year was overwhelming, but he fought with great courage and determination. He stayed positive and hopeful through all adversity. And he told me that he trusted God with the outcome of his surgery. On the day of his, of his surgery, um, the surgeon, Dr. Chamberlain, quoted Joshua 29, 11, and I'd like to read that. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. You will call upon me and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And I just wanted you to know that God is very faithful. Um, we prayed for healing for Mike, and Mike received it. Not in the terms of the physical healing, but definitely he received the ultimate healing, the one we all long for. There was no failure on God's part. Mike is more alive today than he ever was when he was with us. Scripture says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And this makes my heart happy. It's what makes it a celebration. Mike's favorite verse was the 23rd Psalm. I read it to him so many times during his chemo. And uh, also read it his bedside, especially during his last few days. It seemed to bring him so much peace. And I'd like to read it now because I know it will bring you comfort and it will bring peace to your heart as it did to his. And I'm reading it um, from my grandmother's Bible, um, which was at Mike's bedside. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with the wool, thy cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That meant a lot to Mike. And um, I would like to honor him by um, sharing a little bit about each of these verses. So listen carefully because there's a message here for all of us as well. The first verse, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. To me, this verse means that I lack nothing that is necessary for me to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. He is my good shepherd. He invites me into his fold. He loves me and he knows my name. He makes me lie down in green pastures is the next verse. To me that says he leads me to feed upon his word and rest in it unrushed. Um, not to run through it, but to sit and be quiet before the Lord. And I know that every time I read God's Word, that it changes a little bit of me. 
and that's what it's intended to do, to make us more like him. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Um, sheep have a tendency to wander. They get lost, and they get themselves in some pretty big messes. But Jesus loves us enough to pursue us and help us get back into a right relationship with him. He restores our soul, and he does that for our eternal good and for God's own glory. The next verse, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Even in the darkest valleys, no matter what your valley is, and if you live on this earth long enough, uh, we know that we do have trials and tribulations. This says that Jesus is always there. He's always with us. He takes our fears and he covers us with his peace. Your rod and staff comfort me. Uh, the shepherd, if you've seen pictures of a shepherd, he's even either holding um, a staff, which has the hook, shepherd's hook, um, or a rod, just a straight stick. Um, the shepherd would use the staff to pull the sheep out of them when they got in a tangled mess. They could be hung up in a gnarly bush or they could have gotten themselves caught between rocks. Whatever the situation was, the shepherd was there to use that crook and kind of hook it loosely around the sheep's neck and pull them back to safety. And that's what Jesus is, does for us. When we find ourselves in the messes of life, he brings us back into the right relationship with him. And um, the shepherds would use the rod to fight off the wolves, the predators, the animals that would be dangerous for the sheep. And Jesus does that for us because he helps fight the forces of evil around us. It's his word and his spirit that comfort us, the rod and the staff. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. God has prepared a table for us, for the children of God who believe in him. He's provided the food and drink, and I like to think that's the blood and body of Jesus Christ. And he invites us to feast at his table. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Whenever a, a sheep was injured, the shepherd would always pour oil over the injury. It has very much a healing property. And Jesus wants to heal our wounds. Um, his love overflows. Our cup so overflows with the love of Jesus that it spills out of our lives and spills into the lives of others. That's how powerful um, the blood of Jesus is. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I think this is one of the most comforting of all, because that goodness and that mercy is available to us because of what Jesus did on the cross. He was beaten, um, and he was hung on a cross to die. He was buried, but he didn't stay in that grave. Three days later, he was resurrected. He had victory over death, and because of that, Mike is able to be in heaven. Um, death did not win here. Um, he, he is only more alive now than he ever was. Um, Mike accepted Christ when he was in college, at Mississippi College in Mississippi. And like we can sometimes do, that can, your faith can wax and wane. But I do know without a doubt that in the days leading up to his death, he reaffirmed the fact that he had asked Jesus into his heart um, years ago, and that we have the assurance that he's with Jesus now. And I think if Mike were standing here today, I think he would tell you to trust the Good Shepherd. I think he would tell you to invite him into your heart so that someday you can be in heaven with him. I know my family plans to be there. Um, we've already made our reservations by asking Jesus into our heart. And uh, it's pretty amazing. I think Mike would want you to do that. And um, if you never really thought about it, it's as easy as A, B, C. A is just to admit your need for a Savior. You know, we need a Savior. The scripture says, all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. That's me, that's you, that's everybody. B is to believe in Jesus Christ. Scripture tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever 
believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So that's our that's our ticket. Uh, that's how we are able to be with the Lord forever. And C is, is to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so I think if Mike could be here, he would say, I want all of y'all <laughs> to be in heaven with me someday. Um, so search the scriptures. Uh, make your reservations. And I have found um, Neil over here on the front row to be a fabulous uh, friend and pastor through this. And uh, if you ever want to talk to somebody, look up Neil. He's always here. So thank you so much.
Keep me in your heart for a while Hold me in your thoughts Take me to your dreams Touch me as I fall into view And when the winter comes Keep the fires lit And I will be right next to you Engine drivers headed north to Pleasant Street Keep me in your heart for a while These wheels keep turning but they're running out of steam Keep me in your heart for a while Sha la 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 Keep me in your heart for a while for a while. What a wonderful world 
double melts like a lemon drops high above the chimney top. That's where you find me, oh, somewhere over the rainbow, way up high, and the dreams that you dare to. Why, oh why can't I, I, ooh, 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 ooh. enough you. Wow, what a morning we have spent together. What a tribute to Mike. I'm sure you would agree. And as we started out, undoubtedly, that brought up some of the memories that you have with Mike. And again, uh, before we leave here, just want to remind you, take that little card, if you would, and take a moment just to write something. It'll be precious to the family uh, when they receive that. And before you, you go, take a look again at this picture up front. Take a look at, at these pictures up front. And again, not to be the, this is not a downer at all, but... I've been thinking a lot that one day, one day that's going to be my picture here. One day that's going to be yours. And we talked a lot about Mike and where he is now. And, and like you, I so desperately want the fact that Mike is in a, the better place. I want it to be because he drove a nice car. I want it to be because he wanted to be a general manager so badly. I wanted to be because he was so good to so many people. He's an incredible father to Alex and to Brooke and Haley. I wanted to be all those things. And he was all those things. This is an incredible tribute to an amazing man. But, but don't leave here missing the point that what sealed Mike's eternity was not any of those things. It was a faith that he had in the Christ that Paula talked about. And, and we as pastors and churches, sometimes we do a terrible job. We keep thinking, if you're good enough, if you put money in the plate, if you come to church, this is not a sales pitch at all. But I don't know, if this might be for some of you to maybe pick up a Bible again. I know Mike did that. And to realize that this is really not a doomsday book at all. In fact, it tells us where life came from. It's a book that tells us that God gives our life meaning and value and purpose. When you put your faith and trust, it's not the goodness, it's what you put your faith in that allows us to say Mike is with the Lord. You know, the book of James says that our life is like a, it's like a vapor. It's like that seeing your breath on a cold day. It's there for a moment and then literally it's gone. You see all these pictures from the time that Mike was young all the way, it just seems like it goes faster and faster and faster. And the good news that the Bible tells us is that this life was never what it was supposed to be about. Just a precursor to eternity. And you're, what you're going to find as you rush back to eat, we're going to do that in a moment. And as you get back into your life, is, this might sort of take the background again. And you put all your eggs in the basket of this world, trying to find your joy in that. And your picture is still going to be there someday. What the Bible says that this world is rigged to never give you the satisfaction you ever want. It's always going to create a thirst that nothing on this earth will satisfy. And as Paula mentioned... Admitting that uh, we need a God that's not us. Believing in a Christ that paid a price on the cross for us. And committing our lives, confessing to follow him is what gives you life's purpose and meaning. So that's all I got for a sales pitch. And uh, as Paula mentioned, we're around here. You're welcome to join us here at all, uh, anytime. I'm going to close us in prayer. And here's what we're going to do again. Um, as we leave here, we're going to go to the right and then to the right again. And uh, pretty self-explanatory. We won't invite you to stay share some food with us, uh, greet the family, maybe drop those cards off. And when I'm done praying, if you don't mind, uh, we're going to allow the family 
to go first. And if you would just allow them to, to exit and uh, get to the uh, room where we'll be having the reception, and then you could follow, that would be great. So I'm going to pray. We're actually going to have a, a bagpiper lead us out. So why don't you uh, take a moment, if you would, why don't we stand together and uh, let's be dismissed with prayer. Father God, once again, we, uh, we are so grateful for Mike's life. God, I am so uh, amazed by this man. I'm so grateful for the friends that he had, for the love that he shared with so many people, particularly with his children, with Alex. God, I'm thankful for a place that we can come and just pause for such a short time from all of our busy lives. And I pray that this morning has made an impact on each of our hearts, that we leave here contemplating, reflecting on what truly is the most important. Yeah, being nice, working hard, loving people. But God, more than anything, is putting our faith and trust in the God who created this universe, who sent a son to tell us all about eternity, and then who laid his life down. So as we put our faith in him, we too could share the eternity that Mike is enjoying. Father, we pray that you continue to comfort this family in the days ahead as the dust settles and everyone heads back to life and the busyness of their worlds. God, let the spirit of all comfort comfort us. And Lord, you continue to move and to work your plan in all of our lives so that you would be glorified in it all. Father, as we now gather over the reception, pray that you bless our time together. You bless the food that we'll receive and enjoy, the words that we'll share with one another. May we leave here encouraged, challenged, and changed, and a focus on you. We ask it all in your son's name.